welcome back so we have another ama here this time with the uh illustrious and notorious michael brown from vicarious pr who if you follow the podcast you've probably heard him once or twice on there as well and so we're getting all of your pr and marketing questions answered right here live on the show uh welcome back michael thank you so give the folks that don't know who you are a little rundown of, of why you know one or two things about you know game pr because you're sitting there and you have all of your trophies blocked by you know your your head yeah. so well it is a pretty big head so don't do it no so i'm michael um i'm the ceo of vicarious pr i'm also the ceo of v publishing um so i um vicarious pr has been around for about four kind of four years now um and we've done everything from um, solo indie game projects to helping AAA studios launch their titles across PC, console, and mobile. Um, we have a really cool staff of around um, 12 people who are dotted around um, North America and Europe. Um, so we've uh, we've been through the wars of marketing and PR, and we don't just do. I mean, the the, the company is Vicarious PR, but we we're actually a full creative agency, so we do um, advertising and we do influencers and we do social media and community building um so we have our toes in um pretty much every area of marketing overall when it comes to video games and any form of digital entertainment so you know what we want to talk about today is the evolution of, of game pr and marketing you know and obviously if if you're out there whether you're on twitch or youtube or linkedin or twitter or facebook still to this day can't get all five of those you know remembered at one time ask your question wherever you are it's going to pop up on our screen we'll get it answered live so how how is pr you know especially from the indie side how has pr changed in the last you know four or five years since since streaming took off basically yeah i mean marketing video games is is a constantly changing thing and it's something you know like video games themselves right they go through trends and they go through different waves of what's what's popular and what's not um indie game pr in particular um, has always been tough and it's only getting tougher because what we've had i mean when you're talking specifically media side what you find what you've what you've what you've seen especially over the last five years in particular is a very heavy shift towards the more popular titles getting more coverage on websites versus indie games um and the reason for that is it's not because journalists don't want to cover cool indie games it's because the the sad reality is that covering an indie game does not get you website clicks and therefore is you know in terms of ad revenue not worth anything to the website and so what's happening is that a lot more media sites are now specifically focusing on more content towards the Fortnite of the world and call of duties and all of the triple a stuff um and that leaves very you know very few very little room for indies so you know you're you're having to as an indie now you're having to battle out against hundreds of other indies at any one time um for a very limited amount of screen time when it comes to the media um so it's becoming more and more difficult and so what we've seen is really a need to expand marketing strategies overall than what used to be because you know even five ten years ago now if you think about it there was a time where you could just run pr from a media side contact a bunch of journalists and there'd be a good chance that your game would get covered and there'd be a good chance that that coverage would lead to popularity um and the reality is that's not the case anymore you have to take a more broad view and a more varied strategy. So it's, you can't just put all your eggs in one basket and, and hope for the best. You have to really focus on multiple aspects, including influences, including a really long build up to build community um, and try and diversify your portfolio when it comes to marketing outreach in, in order to see the success that you want to see. So it's a very good point and it, it's one that I know because I, I didn't have to do a lot of PR and marketing for, I don't know, 
18 of my 20 some years. And so full disclosure, Michael and his team are the ones that help us on the indie game business side with these events. And it is a struggle and it's frustrating. And so what we finally came around to on this one is, you know, focusing a little more on content marketing. And that's where, you know, the whole website clicks, you know, that, that mentality is what you have to have. It's not enough to go and say, hey, look, we're, we've got this great tool that's free for developers to use and is accessible and it will help you because they don't care, you know, mm -hmm. un unless it's, it's getting them clicked. So how can an indie team, you know, get their mindset into, you know, a, a little bit away from maybe what makes my game cool and a little bit more into what's the story behind it, what can what's going to get clicks on that website? How can they wrap their head around that? There's a couple of different ways to do it. I mean, there's no, if there was a, if there was a golden rule, um, I'd make a lot more money than I do. And Me too. you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it would be really easy and everyone would achieve success. It's not, it's not as clear cut as that because it's, it, you have to take it by a project by project basis. But I would say building community has become ever more important because you can use that community as leverage when you do go to the media right so if you're an indie game and you know you've got to, got to think of your competition so who you're going up against on any given day to try and get you know a spot on on game spot or pc game or somewhere like that you're probably going up against triple a budgets and you've got a budget of 10 grand for the year right for your marketing budget like you you've, you've got no chance when it comes to spend power so what i would do and what we've done with with, with a lot of our clients is we look at okay so Let's just go direct to the consumer. Let's go run a closed beta and say, "Oh, let's do, um, let's offer the beta up to our, you know, Facebook community. Let's grow that fan base for like six months, right? And then by the time that six months over, you've gone from maybe five hundred followers to several thousand followers who actively enjoy your game, and then suddenly." you can then go to the media and the first thing the media like a journalist is going to do is they're going to research about your game and they're going to click on the game website now if they click on the game website and the first thing that they see is your social media stats in terms of they have 7000 likes on facebook they have a community discord of like 3000 people it suddenly becomes a lot more interesting to them because you have a proof of concept right there because people like it and so if people like it that means it's going to draw traffic and so you have to use all the different strat all the different avenues of marketing to synergize and complement one of each other and the same goes for influencers right so if you manage to convince an influencer to play your game on youtube and that video does really really well and you get a lot of traffic from that then that then will lead itself into your community building and into the media approach as well because again it's a proof of concept right there so we're already getting questions in, which is good. So from Christopher, what's your approach for creating a marketing mix for titles in a global setting for many different languages and cultures? So you have to, one of the things that we've done for global launches, you really have to take into account, obviously local cultures, and you have to really research. Research and preparation is key when it comes to something like that, because you wanna, you wanna have a good team that understands the local region, understands the local customs, because you have to then localize your game to fit that, because there's nothing worse than launching a game. It's not just enough, in my opinion, to launch a game with more languages. It's you need to adapt the content slightly sometimes in order to be able to effectively penetrate that marketplace. So some, you know, because something that is absolutely fine in the West might not sit so well in uh, an Eastern country or something like that. So you have to really get, do your research and figure out what people like, what in, and it's, it's all about segmentation market, right? Like which gamers from which countries like what? And so if you're an FPS, um, you need to figure out what's okay and what's not in each country and then adapt to figuring out not only what content needs to be in the game, but also how are you gonna market that to then represent in each country because how you talk to Americans is very different to how you talk to British people. It's very different to how you talk to French people. It's very different to how you talk to Russian people, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's all about research and preparation when it comes to that. So next question, this is from the Discord. And so, yeah, this is while we're saying from the Discord, 
no matter, don't forget, put your stuff in here. You can put it on our Discord. We'll get this stuff answered. So, you know, as a small studio, we wear many hats. How does a studio without a PR and marketing specialist go about crafting general or even specific talking points that can best serve the company? And you can't cheat on this one, Michael, and say hire a marketing specialist. So there's okay. a well, if I can't cheat and say hire a marketing specialist, um, I think. <laughs> we, <laughs> To hire one, <laughs> but, but no. But I think I think realistically, you have to. A bit of testing really comes into play here. So, develop a core message. Figure out what your key features of the games are, and then look at okay. Let's try some out on social media. See which ones play the best. See which ones get the most engagement. And it's a little bit of you know A/B testing and a little bit of refining that as you talk to as you as you go through the first initial stages of doing outreach for your game, talk to as many people about the game as possible and gauge what their response is to your key message. And then if the response is kind of, eh, then change it, right? And then just fiddle with it each time. And you know, if you, if you look at any really big successful indie game, the one thing that they will tell you in the early days that they did is they told they talked about the game constantly with players with other people in the industry to really refine that message so that every time that they then said that message they knew that it was the one that was going to make the biggest impact and so it's just a it's just about dipping your, your toes in the water and then you know seeing what really hits home and what really doesn't and then changing that and so the best and you know try and judge it on a, on a multi-level basis so try and look at you know metrics to back that hypothesis up so craft two messages test them out see which one does performs better on social and, and and vice versa and just keep doing that until you've refined something that you think um seems to work really well with a lot of people so are folks in the press and the media more or less likely to answer an email or respond to one that you know comes from mailchimp or send in blue versus one that's I don't know what it'd be called. Normally sent. In what way? So, all right, when you're talking about that, the, the thing that I have in my mind is okay. You can A/B test these things, mm -hmm. but to do that, you need to put them in Mailchimp or or we use Send in Blue, you know, for the show. Uh, would you do that? And it always, you know, I always recommend to developers on the business side. It's like mm -hmm. don't submit to publishers from Mailchimp because it just looks stupid you know you're, you can't come across as sounding genuine to a publisher when mm -hmm. at the bottom of the email it says unsubscribe from mailchimp is that how is that taken on the media and pr side because obviously if you can do that without much you know blowback then it's an easy way to a b test these headlines or these intros so i always recommend i would a b test with consumers versus instead of media because you what you don't want to end up doing is sending media a ton of emails um and not you know you want to really refine that message before your outreach to journalists for the most part what i would go for if you want to test out a message and want to figure out what your key talking points are talk to some smaller influencers talk to your facebook community talk to a you know twitter community and even ask for feedback from other indies right like Look, look for someone who's another indie studio who has no skin in the game in terms of what game you're creating and say, can I run my pitch by you and ask for feedback? Um, you don't necessarily have to do like a big outreach for that to, to refine your message. I would avoid talk, avoid talking to anybody that you like, you know, you don't want to send an email to PC Gamer and then send another email a week later with a different message to PC Gamer again and then send another, e you know, like, that's never going to get you anywhere. And by the time that you figure your message out, they're not going to care anymore because they've had nine emails from you and they're sick of hearing from you. Um, what I would do is start small, start with um, Facebook, Twitter, and smaller influencers. Talk to people who, you know, have maybe like 500 subscribers on YouTube or, 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 or you know, Twitch streamers and say, hey, will you check out my game? Let me know what you think of it. Even run like a closed alpha test with like 50 people. That will provide you with valuable information about what people like and don't like about your game. Um, and the key is just get, find, you know, figure it out, make sure that, you know, if, for example, one of the things that we do, we do when we do alpha tests is we make sure that the report 
that we produce in terms of the survey and the questions asked are actually valuable questions, right? Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to ask for some, well, what do you think, what's good about this, right? Well, what does that mean, right? If there's, if there's very specific things that you want to know about your game and so you can turn that into marketing, into marketing messaging, ask the question about that specific thing. So where you say, you know, I want to figure out if my first person shooter has really good controls. Ask about the controls. Don't just do be generic and say, oh, well, is my game good? Because most people either not answer or they'll say, yeah, sure. Right? Ask very specific things and get that specific feedback so that you can take that and then use that. Um, so start small with the messaging. And then only when you've figured out your messaging and you're happy with it and people seem to respond well to it, then do your bigger outreach to, to journalists and, and the larger influencers. Oh, I'm, I'm laughing at Joseph <laughs> Joseph's comment down in there is YouTube, and we'll get to that in a minute, Joseph. Oh, and now I lost my I lost my next question. Hold on a second. So here we go. This is a, this is a follow up to the early one. So, how can a small company make inroads with getting their story covered? I've emailed dozens of news websites and gaming websites, and I have zero responses so far. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> so, I, you know, I had a, I had someone the other day say that my job was easy and that all I do is send emails, and I'm like, so at least somebody knows it's not that easy. Yeah. Um, so, what I would do is first look, like, take a look at visually what you're sending out. Take a look at are my assets really good? Um, is the is everything? the best foot forward that I can put it in terms of screenshots, in terms of trailer, everything like that. Um, then I would look at the text. So is the text the best it can be? Am I describing my game in a really generic, boring way? Like there's nothing worse. Uh, you know, a lot of my staff are former game journalists, for example. There's nothing, and they'll tell you, there's nothing worse than getting an email with the subject. Check out my Puzzle 2D platformer. So what should that subject line say? Right. I think, well, it depends. It depends on the game, but like you have to look at, okay, so so for example, we had a 2D puzzle platform a couple of years back um, that I really enjoyed, and the, the that game had, um, it was, a, you, you phase shifted in between um, realities, and so enemies would appear in the dark reality, and it was all about, it was basically about mental illness, and it was about... Um, how you go from being in a happy place and the surroundings all happy and then as soon as you start thinking negatively everything the exact same setting and the exact same world turns to shit because that's how you're thinking um and so we pitched it from we, we, we talked about that mechanic and we talked and we focused on that so we never once mentioned that it was a 2d puzzle platformer we just talked about the experience of the game and what the game looks to explore um and the same goal like a, another perfect example of that is um uh, uh, an indie game we did that was a puzzle game and no one likes hearing about puzzle games in, in an email subject and so the game was essentially about um you had to kill people by causing accidents so instead of saying hey this is a game this is a puzzle game where you kill people we said why don't you check out final destination the game right and that instantly got people interested because a lot of people who saw what um a lot of people who saw final destination the film understood what that meant and so it was it was a really easy way to describe something that was cool without being putting people to sleep instantly because you're describing your game exactly the way 90 other people that day are describing their game so let's see what the next one so frank from from facebook asked what's the best social media to buy attention in in terms of roi uh it, so that depends on the game. It depends on what platform you're selling on. Um, usually what I would do is I would test them all out and see which gives you the best ROI and then double down on those ads. And there's also variables in that in, in terms of like quality of creative um, and everything like that. I would say right now, the best ROI I'm seeing across the across the board, in gen generally speaking for clients, tends to be Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, Twitter ads tend not to get as much traction as I would like them to. All right, so ours is, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. Yeah, go on. Ours for the show this time is exactly the opposite. Yeah, that's because there's a big, the, the game dev community is much bigger and prominent on 
um, Twitter than it is on any other platform. Okay, so that's one of those that if you're B2B Twitter. Mm -hmm. it, it comes down to where your audience is as well. So that's like audience is a big factor, right? So if you're if you're Fortnite, for example, and you're marketing to you know 12 to 18 year olds, then Instagram and TikTok are your places to be, right? If you're if you're marketing to game developers, a lot of them interact on, on, on for a community side on Twitter. So Twitter is your place to be. So it comes down to audience targeting, creative. Like there's lots of variables in that. Um, so once you figure out who your audience is, once you've got a good creative in play, then that kind of that often more than not will choose your platform for you because you'll know exactly where to market your uh, which social media to market on. So how do you attack Reddit with, without getting flamed, kicked, whatever? I mean, is or do, are Reddit ads the way to go? I like Reddit ads. I've seen pretty good. Well, I've seen varying degrees of success on Reddit ads. I like them in general. I think it's much easier to run a Reddit ad than it is to try and build up a ton of karma in a community over six months and then maybe be able to post a self-promotional post if the admin's okay with it one time. Like, it, the, it's, a, it's a bigger shortcut to at least getting a good amount of exposure soon. Um, I've seen a pretty good response rate overall in terms of click-throughs from Reddit as well. So, but what, the one thing that I will tell you as a piece of advice, if you do run Reddit ads, don't allow comments, okay? Never do that. <laughs> that I, made, I made the mistake of ticking the, not ticking the box once, and I've never forgot it since because I got like 3,000 comments that were all just shit posts. <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. Right. See, I would have thought that, you know, people that are on Reddit are a little more tech savvy than a lot of the people that are just on Facebook. And so my first assumption is if you're on Reddit, you're running an ad blocker. So what's the point in running an ad on Reddit? Well, it can't be, yeah, but it doesn't. I don't think ad blockers hit Reddit ads because it, it shows up in the feed rather than it's not a pop up. Ah, that's a good point. I did not think about that. All right, so Christopher from YouTube. Hey, Christopher, just hey, shout out. I appreciate you sticking with us for three days because you've been put, you've popped up in several you know, different events and, and sessions and asked questions. So thank you. So, what types of paid media do I tend to invest in? So, this is a little bit of what we talked about, but. You know, Victoria Trans Marketing Plan has seen a lot of success working almost entirely on earned and owned media with no paid media. So, where what do you think on that side? I tend I tend to do the same. I tend not to. I mean, m my job is basically to do that, and um, that is what a PR professional is there to do. I'm not there to buy media for the most part. Um, so, when it comes to media outreach, I tend not to buy. Um, I, I've if I'm brutally honest. I've never seen a really good media buy that has produced the ROI for the cost, but I will say that I have bought media. Um, I've done media buys to support a site that I know has been in trouble just to, just to be able to give that site revenue because I want to see that site succeed over the long term. Um, but I've, ne I, I've never been one to make paid media an, uh, 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 an integral part of any marketing strategy for the most part. I would say the, the, the exception to that is potentially paid influencers um, because there are some influencers who some games just have to have in order to succeed and those influencers know it too. And so they will not cover you without throwing money at them. Um, so I would say that's the only exception. But for the most part, I think if you have a good game, you can get by uh, if you have a good game coupled with a good marketing strategy, you can get by without paid media. All right. So touching on that, let's take the same question and look at it in terms of influencers. Where do you spend your money with influencers? How do you sort out which ones are going to give you the best ROI? That Well, that's again, that depends on how well you target and it depends on the game, right? Because I've had... I've had campaigns where we've had really good returns in terms of views from paid influencer campaigns that have led to absolutely bugger all sales and vice versa. I've had campaigns that I've paid no money and that have led to a ton of sales. So it, it like the genre is quite, and the, and the click through rate per, depending on the game is very, very variable. Um, I would say as a general rule, 
I use top tier influencers, th those with hundreds, if not millions of subscribers as brand exposure to b build awareness about a product. And I use medium to small influencers to actually sell product. Because what I found is for the most part is that the more popular the influencer in terms of pure viewership numbers, the less likely those people are to actually then act upon um, whatever it is they're playing. Because if you think about it, people who watch someone like PewDiePie, for example, they're not there to watch the game, they're there to watch him as a personality. So they're, there, they're not there looking for a recommendation of what they're gonna play next, they're there to enjoy a piece of entertainment. Versus someone who's maybe got 50,000 subscribers who regularly does reviews, that community is very tight and they go to that person because they know what they like and so they're looking for recommendations for products. Um, and so that's what I tend to. So explain the difference between using someone for brand awareness and using someone for sales. What's okay. the difference? So let's say, let's say, let's say YouTuber X has 3 million subscribers and YouTuber Y has 50,000 subscribers. YouTuber X plays, the, the guy with the millions of subscribers will play a game and millions of people will see it. And then he will also start, probably start a trend among other influencers who watch him and they will go play that game. So I've got organic coverage coming out of that. So it's a trickle down effect and lots of people have heard the, the, the brand. I might get, you know, I might get wish lists or I might get sales from that, but I'm not 100% counting on it because I know the majority of people who watch that channel are there to watch that personality because they like him. Whereas YouTuber, the other YouTuber with 50,000, like maybe he does let's plays, maybe he does reviews or whatever. I know that that person has a really tight community because I've researched them and I know a lot of people, a lot of his subscribers then go and buy based on the comments and stuff like that, go buy the products that he recommends. And so I know that the actual click through rate and the actual conversion rate from that influencer is going to be leaps and bounds higher than the one with the millions because that's how that community works versus how that community works. Um, and so it's, it's all about intent. Um, and you have, and again, it, it, you know, re, research is key f for stuff like this because you have to be making sure that the influencer that you're having playing your game has your target audience in mind as well. So what do you what do you use to do this research when you're um, trying to figure out who their audience is? And all you, so honestly, there's no like quick tool to do it. You just look at like Sully Gnome for Twitch and then you look at numbers, you look at subscribers, you look, research the comments and then you have to watch the content. And you mean it's actual work? I can't I, just like... I, I know, I can't just like use a tool and like type it in and gives me something, you know, like I have to actually watch videos, hours and hours of content, figure out who they are, what they like, and then research that or put that down, prepare a whole document of, you know, that this is why we're going for that, what their target audience is and everything like that. So yeah. All right, I, I just came up with our new business model. So where we used to live, we were right nearby one of the major distributions for an adult movie and um, stuff company online they hire people because a buddy of mine's wife worked there and, and he got this job it is a job to watch adult movies and take notes on what happens so can we then turn our kids into note gathering systems on youtubers i do you just <laughs> oh you're ahead of the curve already. Yeah, that's, I, have this, I have six children. That's what I do all the time. I'm like, who are you watching at the moment? Why are you watching them? Like, I like because I have a really good range as well because my oldest is 16. And um, then I've got, you know, 16, 14, 12, 9, uh, two, another 9, and then um, Molly, who's 6, so she's not into YouTube yet. Um, likes Animal Crossing, though. Um, and so I always ask them like what they're what see what they're watching, what kind of content they're watching, and then you know try and get see what you know because kids are often you know they're way up on trends before anybody else most of the time. So I'm always like interested in what they're watching and who they're watching and why they're watching them and what makes it funny for them to watch that piece of content. And 
So yeah, if you've got kids, it's a you've got your, you've got your own focus testing panel then. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I do with that's what I do with the V publishing games. I have them play it. <laughs> I'm like, do you like do you like it? I'm gonna keep that in mind on what I send you in the future. Um, <laughs> all right, so I had that question that I had something else, but then I totally got caught up on farming work out to our kids. Um, so with TikTok, how do you see its future with it possibly going to be banned in the U.S.? I don't see it going away. It's, yeah, it's, it's far too popular. Um, and if you look at the numbers, if you look at the sheer numbers of TikTok's user base, it's just, it's not going anywhere. I can't, I don't imagine that they're actually really going to ban it. And if they do, it'll be back at some point. Um, so uh, it, it's, I think, and, and especially with, especially with the sheer raw power of its user base and how, especially how a lot of the content on TikTok then gets distributed among Facebook and all the other social platforms. Um, that it's undeniable that it's a, it's a strong platform in and of itself. Yeah. So, um, for those of you not in the States, uh, TikTok is in the news because our president <laughs> is trying to get it banned, uh, basically because he thinks that's why no one showed up to his Tulsa rally. So, um, next question. Oh, and going back to the, so I remembered, I remembered my other one. What is the threshold with influencers? where you see it going from they'll play your game for free to you need to pay me at what point of like subscribers or followers do you see that transition happen it's it's not i mean i've had i mean there's no necessarily transition where that happens i mean i've i've had really very big youtubers play games of ours for free um just because it was interesting to them Right, it all comes down to interest. Like, if you've got something that you know is going to make that, like, for example, if you if you've got an RPG and you're pitching to YouTubers and Twitch streamers who play RPGs and love RPGs, then the chances are they're not going to need much convincing to play that game. Um, whereas if you're pitching that to someone who's a general, a more general streamer with a massive following, and then their interest isn't going to be particularly high in that game, the chances of them then saying, well, I'm not that bothered, but if you pay me, I'll do it, it's probably much higher. It all comes down to interest, right? So Agnes from YouTube says, if your audience is kids, four to eight, and their parents, what platforms and where would you promote your game? Uh, if your audience is kids, four to eight, and their parents, well, parents, I would go for um, Facebook because that's where people like to share kid photos. Um, and I mean, YouTube's pretty strong for kids stuff um, in general. Um, if you're looking for specific ads as well, what I would try and go a much ta a fairly targeted route of not only I'd go through like YouTube ads, for example, and target kid specific channels um, to run ads on rather than just going like a broad outreach. I would try really focus on like. Um, content you know like a couple of years ago it was um those unboxings the kids did where they were like unboxing toys yes. and unboxing lots whatever those stuff. eggs are like I, we did a lot of stuff um with um younger audience games where we really focused heavily on advertising on those channels um because we knew that like there was four to eight year olds just sitting watching hours and hours and hours of people open up my little pony figures um so it, it, you got to think about it's just going through that process right of thinking about who am i targeting and what what what's the entertainment and what's the content that they like to consume right so if you're looking for if you look to specifically target parents then you think about what parents like to do well parents like to like particularly um stay at home mums for example they like especially in, in early stages they like to read mum related content in terms of parenting content because they're always like how many times do people search it's like is this normal for my kid to do is my kid eating paste normal like I, like I all that kind of early thing. on and i only have one kid you don't google shit about kids health on the internet because it's the <laughs> but yeah i mean just think about like you know really think about where your audience what your audience likes to enjoy and then advertise there uh, and promote there versus um one of the worst things that people do for the most part is to think I've got a video game. Therefore I should advertise where video games are. That's not necessarily true. 
like what you should advertise is where your audience is because just because you have a video game doesn't mean that like core gaming content is a perfect place for you to advertise your casual game for example right um so yeah so Frank for Facebook says, I work with a team on a quote, controversial subject based on Native American cultures and spir spiritualities. How would you handle this kind of controversial subject without risking bad buzz? Um, it, <laughs> I mean, it depends on how, what it depends on what the contro controversial nature of it is. If it's just a, if it's just a game that focuses on a Native American story, then it's not controversial, right? Whereas if it's a story focused on um, you, you're doing something controversial to Native Americans in the story, then it's probably <laughs> not great. Um, I mean, there's, there was games like it, there was games about Inuits years ago that was really cool um, and stuff like that. If it explores, if it's a game that explores a culture, it's usually a really good story for media as well. Like because there's nothing like it's really cool to explore cultures through games. Um, so it, it just really depends on. I don't think how being, doing a game about Native American culture is not by in and of itself controversial, in any way. Um, it's just about the con the content of the game. If the content of the game is controversial, then you have to establish. You'd, I would say have a PR professional look through it, because I would need to know more specifics about it um, before deciding on a course of action. Because you have to. It's really. It's very much a, a deep. The, the devil is in the detail on that kind of thing. So you have to look at why is it controversial? Is the, what's the intent? What's the execution? Because um, there's nothing worse on on video games covering a very sensitive topic and doing and executing it in a really tone deaf manner. Like there's nothing worse than that. So I think having someone really look at it and and go through it in detail is probably your best foot forward. What I would probably do is contact a bunch of different marketing agencies, send them a copy of the game. And if you don't have the game ready, send them at least um, a game design document with an outline of like, this is what we're planning. This is what I'm concerned about. Break it down point by point, by point for them. And then just ask for a consultation and be like, is this going to be a problem? So I was, I was pulling in new talks. So Amy, I mean, Anne, any use of Instagram reels for marketing and PR? And so the first thing that you have to do, Michael, is explain to me what an Instagram reel is. <laughs> oh, I hate Instagram so much sometimes. <laughs> Instagram reels like stories, but it's like, it's all kinds of videos. You can use videos and it, it depends, right? So when it comes to choosing what, like it's like Facebook stories, right? So if it, no matter which social media you're using, Ultimately, you want to think about the quality of the content that you're using and the target audience. So, if you so, for example, if you're going to do like an Instagram story, or you want to do Instagram Live, or you want to do you know TikTok, or you want to do some you know Facebook video, native Facebook video that is, uh, or you want to do YouTube, or you want to do something with Twitter, you have to think about what's your intent, what's the purpose, what. What am I trying to achieve? Is my target audience there? And how well can I execute it? Because there's nothing worse than really poor social media content. Um, and there's nothing worse than social media content that um, is over self-promoting, but doesn't provide any entertainment or value um, to the viewer, right? If you can't make a, mo like for example, take video game trailers as a perfect example. It's something that's tried and tested and works, but so many people still get it wrong. And that's because the best video game trailers, whether they're 30 seconds long or two minutes 30 long, come from a place of telling a good story, achieving an emotional connection, or having, or, or not even achieving an emotional connection, evoking an emotion in the viewer, um, and usually being kick-ass, right? So you have to think about, can I do this? Can I achieve this with my content? Um, never use social media as a, as a, as a posting board. Like it, that's not what it's there for. It's there for developing content. And so think about, you know, think about the quality level that you think you can achieve in terms of content. And that will, if you can execute an Instagram reel really well, then do it. 
but if you if you think that you can't or you don't think the quality is going to be there then i would say try something else so what are the best practices for promoting your game on TikTok? Um, content first is, is the best thing. So making something really fun um, is probably more important than you know selling your game or pushing your game. Um, it, it's more important to have really good content that people enjoy because ultimately if you do something that people that if you, for example I don't know if anyone's seen these on on overall over social media recently um, raid Shadowlands is it Shadowlands um, the mobile game raid they've done a, a series of ads that I, I really love um, they basically the first ad that they pushed recently was they took the main character orc and added a, wife, a female, his wife, orc, and they had them in a uh, in a therapist's office with a real human, but it was C two CGI orcs <laughs> in the therapist's office, and she, and she's like, what you know, go on, tell him what you did, tell him what you did, and it cuts to him in a dungeon with a succubus as the as the team player, <laughs> and, like, and they look at each other like that, and he's like, what, what, I, you know, she's in, she's, I needed it, I can't do a dungeon solo, and she's like, so it had to be her. And he's like, she's crazy good in dungeon, and like she started the orc starts hitting, she starts hitting him in this like you know like a marriage counseling thing. I think that was the funniest thing ever, and it wasn't like what I loved about that ad is that it was relatable, it was super funny, and it did nothing in terms of promoting the game. It wasn't trying to push. Look at our players. Look at the you know the turn based strategy. Look at the progression. It was just funny, entertaining content, right? And that alone made me go. I really like that game because instantly you like the ad. And so you go, I like that game. Right. And they talk nothing about what the game's actually about. And so that's the kind of thing that you want to, that's the mindset that you want to be in when you're doing content is make it good. Think of promote the game second, right? Because if it's good, then people will come anyway. So that's the, that's the key thing. So next from the discord, in my last week of Kickstarter, still barely any media except for Nintendo Switch. So other than media, where do you all think I focus on to attract as many people as possible to the last stretch? Um, so yeah, I wouldn't rely on media for Kickstarters because the majority of media don't enjoy covering Kickstarters at this point at all. Um, media confidence in Kickstarters is at an all time low on top of the fact that they consider it to be advertising at this point. Um, so I would go for, I don't know the specifics of your Kickstarter, but if you've got a playable build or you've got a demo, push it to as many influencers as possible um, and then really try and focus on um, gaming communities on social media and try and get people to play the game um, and to talk about the game. So that's what I would, that's what I would try and focus on. So there's another one from the Discord. When I present my game to marketing people, they would immediately respond saying, this type of game doesn't sell. What do they mean? Um, <laughs> I would need more specifics, to be honest. I would, I would say that um, if the game is really niche, then it's going to be difficult to... Um, it's going to be difficult to sell... I assume they mean both in terms of um, selling copies and also selling the game in terms of trying to get coverage from media and influencers. Um, I'd have to know more specifics about it, to be honest, but I think it doesn't necessarily mean that it won't sell some copies, but I think you have to, you have to weigh up, right? So if you're an indie developer and you've got a limited budget and you're making a really niche game, you don't what you, what you don't want to happen is you don't want to end up where you're spending tons of money on marketing and PR, and the ROI is never going to be there, right? Because it's a really niche product that not many people are going to buy. Like if you're if your potential is like ten thousand sales, do you really want to spend eighty thousand dollars on PR and marketing? Probably not, right? So it's it, that's maybe what they mean. I mean, if they haven't clarified that for you, then don't know what to tell you um but you know you can always send it to me and i can give you some 
honest feedback. You might not like the honest feedback, but I'll give you some anyway. That's the beauty of honest feedback. All right, so we got one more from the Discord, and we're coming up on, on time, so we're going to... I want to say we're going to kick it after this one, but if you have a question, you should either get it in now or pop it over to the Discord and ask it in our post-session channel. So Michael is over there as much as he tries to hide sometimes. I know where to find him and he can answer your questions. So last question, what do you find are the most difficult channels or social media to track in order to see where sales are coming from? Uh, this yes, yeah, this well, welcome to the bane of my existence for the most part, right? Because if if you're selling PC and on Steam, then it's impossible to track anything because Steam does not want to integrate with anything at all ever. Um, so that's a massive pain. Um, usually, all we can do is usually the best that we try. So what we try, like for example, for influencer stuff, we try and use stuff like Bitly links and anything we can track um, as close as possible. Um, with Steam in particular, like it would be really helpful, hint, hint, Valve, if you could like incorporate some stuff like Facebook Pixel and, and other items that I could actually see what those users do when they get on the page so I could see actual conversion rates. Um, but, you know, that would make everybody's life more easy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, and trying to track to accurately, especially on PC, is very, very difficult. Um, especially if you're using some something like Steam to sell your game, it's, it's a lot easier to do it when you are using your own website to purchase. Um, especially, like, I think, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you do, like, um, pre-orders through, like, places like Zola, they're able to build a website and you can integrate a bunch of tools so you can more accurately track what people do when and where they come from. Um, Usually for st stuff like Steam, it's best guess. For consoles, it's even more best guess because it's on a completely separate platform. Um, mobile's really easy to do. Um, if you've got the right analytics in mobile, I mean, that one of, that's one of the things I love doing about mobile games is just the sheer data that you get from doing user acquisition um, because I can tell you exactly what, what, you know, what my customer likes to have for breakfast because I have that much data. Um, that's not easy at all. <laughs> but, but I mean, see, but that's the thing. You say that though, but you know, people willingly put a camera and a microphone in their pockets all, you know, for the past 10 years. And, but they complain about, you know, can't have my privacy. You don't have privacy. You just have the illusion of it. So it's okay. I got a huge kick several years ago when everybody convinced that the CIA was spying on everyone. And I'm like, do you even play mobile games? Because if you knew what we know, from your Candy Crush habit, yeah. you would be even more terrified. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so yeah, but I mean, if if to answer your question, it's pretty difficult to see strong data when you're on either a console or um, PC. If you're on mobile, then it's not a problem at all. Um, so what? What? So what I would do actually, um, in order to um, Oh, so he was wondering about the tracking on Steam. Okay. Yeah, so what I would actually do is before you launch the game, um, for the most part, for those who haven't launched yet, um, try newsletter signups. <laughs> and so what I what I try to do is look at, like, send people to my website, and I've got all the, the, the analytics embedded in there from, like, Facebook, Twitter, everything like that. And then I can view who signs up to the Discord and who signs up to the newsletter um, as a percentage from all the different channels. And then you kind of will get a rough accuracy. You can kind of guesstimate based on the conversion rates of that, of what it's going to be like when you sell the game. It's not going to be 100% accurate, obviously. And you can also do things like once you've actually launched, stop all promotion. Like say, say two months after launch, right? Stop all promotion across the board and then just do Facebook ads and then measure the increase versus the previous you know say that you stop for two weeks and then start facebook ads only then you can see the increase and then you can measure what the actual impact is um and vice versa so you can do it like that it takes a lot more time and it is a massive pain in the ass um but you know unfortunately until valve start to play ball with like the rest of the world which is never gonna happen, that ain't gonna happen. no that's, that's just gabe don't even want to come back to the u.s he's living in new zealand now yeah so 
All right, so we are at the end of our wonderful AMA, but like I said, Michael is on Discord, and we've got a post-show uh, room set up for you in, in the channels, and we also have an AMA room, so you, you can find him there as well. Uh, feel free, go to discord.gg slash indie game business and join us there. And Michael, uh, thank you for taking time to do this, and personally, thank you for all that you and your team do for this event as well. You're welcome. It's, it's, um, it, it's a big help. Uh, all right, so next we've got coming up, we only have two more sessions left, and then I get to sleep. Um, what's next? Grover, so this is a good one. Grover Wembley is going to be here. He is going to be talking about showcasing your game at expos, whether it's physical or virtual. So what works, what doesn't work, what recommendations, all that kind of good stuff. And then after that, we've got Bao Dong from Google. And he is talking about how to grow your game's profitability, uh, especially optimal paid user acquisition, which is obviously important if you're doing a mobile game. Um, and so stick around, follow us, like us. That way you know when the next event goes live. But I can go ahead and tell you it's going to be in about seven minutes. Uh, and until then, thank you much. Thank you, Michael.